Greenlight XPS, unedited video, 40 gram bilobar prostate. Surgery and narration by Dr. Kevin Zorn. The following educational video will take the viewer through the standard vapor technique for green light XPS. This represents the ideal cases to be done in the initial learning curve of one's experience with a prostate under 50 grams. We begin the procedure by doing a standard atraumatic entry of our laser resectoscope sheath. In this instance, we use the Storch 23 French laser bridge under direct vision to ensure an atraumatic entry into the bladder. Once through the urinary sphincter, we pass the vera montanum followed by both lobes of the prostate. Here we see a, a more asymmetric left lateral lobe with some entry and projection into the bladder. Time should be taken to inspect the bladder walls and identify the location of both ureteral orifices. Here we can visualize the right ureteral orifice, which is quite close to the edge of the prostatic rim. We initialize surgery by first creating a distal margin by using the vaporization in a semicircular technique just in front of the vera montanum. This helps protect the sphincter and demarcate the edge of our resection to minimize the risk of urinary incontinence. One may encounter submucosal bleeding from the site and simple compression followed by coagulation is all that is required to achieve good visual control. Once our visual landmark has been created, we can then draw attention to the bladder neck, bring our laser fiber out and begin by creating a 30 degree groove from the bladder neck to the vera montanum. This is done usually at the five o'clock position. We then turn to the bladder neck and create a six to seven o'clock groove, thereby creating a working space so that we have fluid constantly surrounding our fiber. The power setting here is at 80 watts and we will continue to create a sulcus groove through the adenoma down to surgical capsule, best first visualized at the bladder neck at that five o'clock position. We tend to develop the left lateral lobe and treat that through a vapor technique by initially finding the capsule and working that tissue down a capsule, then partaking it to the contralateral lobe. This is all done after the floor has been treated. In this particular case, due to the asymmetry of that left lateral lobe, we have carved in almost at a three o'clock position to dive down toward capsule. We then come back to the natural neutral position and begin the treatment down a capsule at the seven o'clock groove. We will pass repetitively from bladder neck to vera montanum, always pulling back toward the scope and toward the vera montanum rather than anteriorly, particularly because if we slip, we enter the bladder, we may injure that orifice. So the motions are always from bladder neck back to vera montanum in a slow sweeping manner and increasing the power as the tissue becomes more dense and deeper into the prostate we go. We generally increase to the interval from 80 to 120 watts once we've created a large working space and we keep that energy setting until we really develop the two edges of the tissue we want to remove, be it the floor, the left lateral lobe or the right lateral lobe and only then will br we bring it up to 180 watts to really vaporize that pedunculated piece of adenoma. Here we can see although the channel of prostate is quite small, it is quite deep, so we are taking the necessary time to repetitiously pass over the tissue, almost sometimes using it like a knife to carve into the adenoma and get down to capsule. It is very important that we identify this landmark before proceeding on with the rest of the surgery. This will define, define our endpoint. Usually when we get down to surgical capsule, we will also encounter small capsular stones, and this may light off our fiber life, sort of the disco strobing light, which we will tend to see when we get an overheating of the fiber. Simply brushing over these stones will push them away and allow us to clear up the surgical capsule. During the learning curve, it is very important to identify the color 
and horizontal fibers of the surgical capsule. It can quite nicely be seen with a green light laser, especially once we define it, we can surf that capsular plane. So it's very important to get through the yellow tan brown adenoma after passing over initially and you really carve down and make sure you see that capsule. This is typically first visualized near the bladder neck where the level of the transition zone is thinnest. And as we come back, it becomes thicker and this is why it's very important to really make sure that capsular groove is made from the bladder neck down to vera montanum. Typically undertreated areas is mid to apical tissues and that is where a lot of surgeons are afraid of causing incontinence and thereby do not fully resect the transition zone in those areas. At this point we can quite nicely see that we've gotten down to surgical capsule. We see the small little stones just proximal to the vera montanum and we're taking down this groove between 7 and 6 o'clock and start moving our way undermining the floor adenoma. Once this plane of cleavage has been created, it's quite nice to simply follow along that natural white groove plane. In this case, we're going to head a little bit undermining the right lateral lobe and debulking that tissue. You can appreciate that at some points we drag the fiber along that point of cleavage. In this instance, we're going to simply rotate in a 30 degree manner, very slow sweep speed to vaporize and remove tissue. Here we can see that there is a small, a small layer left of transition zone tissue and so we'll dive down a little bit more now that we've created a large working space to really ensure that we are in the right plane. This will be carried along that plane to the right of the screen, therefore toward the left lateral lobe to ensure that we really resect the lower floor of the prosthetic fossa. Here we can see a good amount of tissue, so we will now use more of a slow sweeping rotations. Note the 30 degree, sort of two hours on a clock rotation of the fiber, slowly drawing back toward the vera montanum. Occasionally we will get some fiber life due to those small stones and simply working around them is all that is required. Here we can see we're still working on the floor and there's still a remaining bit of tissue, taking the time to simply paint over that area to really create a clean working space. And I think this is really important for post-operative dysuria. We'll have less inflammation if the surface is less necrotic and less tissue debris, It'll lead to earlier re-epithelialization of this area. We now turn more toward the 3 o'clock area, a little higher than standard, simply due to that asymmetry of that left lateral lobe and creating a groove deep toward the surgical capsule and for performing repetitious sweeps and as well as drawing motions to create a nice open and avascular working space in which to see the capsule. Sometimes submucosal bleeders can be identified and the use of coagulation along with compression using the fiber of that vessel to coapt and ensure no bleeding is all that is required to achieve good hemostasis. Here we are just taking the time to assess the lower floor amount of tissue and using our laser fiber debulk a good chunk of the adenoma. Note the ease in which especially this fiber compared to the second generation fiber is quite robust, is able to withstand being in contact with tissue and creates a nice opening upon passage over the tissues. This is now at 120 watts and we can see the effect it has on tissue removal. Now this patient has been on a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor for quite some time and especially in this area you can see how more stiff the tissue is. It does not respond as well as the initial vaporization and this is just simply a composition issue of the heterogeneity of the prostate. There are certain areas that are more dense, more stromal, less vascular 
and we'll take a little bit more time and repetition over that area to create the tissue defect we're looking for. After taking a look back from the Vera Montana, we see that our 7 o'clock groove is quite well defined, but our right sided or the 5 o'clock groove has not. So as such, we're going to take a little bit more time and create a symmetric groove down to the capsule. We are a bit thrown off, as mentioned, because of the asymmetry and is simply taking the time to adapt and create the working space and the grooves that we intend to have on every case, no matter what. It's also be noted that all patients undergoing this procedure should have cystoscopy and a transrectal ultrasound in order to not be surprised, particularly in one's initial learning curve. We can now start appreciating the sulcus formation at the 5 o'clock area. This is simply from the concave to the more convex deep opening that occurs and simply the passage once again of the fiber like a small laser knife to open up and dig deeper toward the surgical capsule. As expected, when we do get to surgical capsule, there are often small little perforating vessels that we may encounter, and simply taking the time to compress, identify the exact location, and then use the coagulation setting pedal to achieve good hemostasis. This is part of one's learning curve, and once treated, can return to regular tissue removal with vaporization as we can see here. We will then use the laser fiber to widen that groove, taking some more of the left lateral lobe as well as the stump of tissue on the floor still remaining. At this point the power can also be brought up since we are now well aware of where the surgical capsule is located. We will now spend time better delineating that 5 o'clock groove and again widening it with repetitive sweeping and withdrawing motions. Once we've isolated this pedunculated lobe of tissue on the floor, we can bring the power to 180 and spend the time from either of the sulcuses firing horizontally and thereby always having a direct visual cue of distance away from tissue. The optimal distance is approximately two millimeters which is about the width of our surgical fiber cap. Here we can appreciate not only the robustness of this XPS moxie fiber, but also the amount and density of this floor tissue, particularly on the left side of the patient. It's a little more stubborn and requires more attention, more retreatment over the same areas, simply due to its chemical composition. Nevertheless, the XPS system can quite easily get through this tissue without any damage to the fiber glass itself due to the internal cooling and the metallic cap as well as the software for the fiber life which advises the surgeon of any overheating of the fiber. The very powerful laser which with a nice collimated beam has good efficiency up to three millimeters away from the tissue. Here we begin to appreciate the fibers of the surgical capsule near the five o'clock area
of the bladder neck. This will be widened and slowly brought back proximally toward the vera montanum. In essence, this approach is very similar to the nucleation technique done by those using the homium laser. It has excellent outcomes. However, with the homium, it requires a secondary procedure and secondary equipment for true morselation. So although this is a similar approach to a holup, or the nucleation of the prostate, it is simply the enucleative properties and principles that we strive to achieve. However, either doing pure vaporization of the stalks of tissue at their attachment to the capsule, or simply methodically chopping these off into small pieces for later retrieval. The goal being, similar to ureteroscopy, to fragment out the debris, which will be later easily removed with minimally invasive techniques. Rather than using a dedicated morselator, which is truly an intravesical endoscopic surgery, we will break these pieces into small chunks, which will be either removed using a ureteroscopic grasper or simply switching out to a standard TUR loop without the electricity to mechanically pull these pieces out. As we continue to flatten off and smoothen out the remaining bits of tissue on the floor, we want to ensure good hemostasis while at the same time being as efficient as possible without causing too much tissue debris and damage beneath the surface and thereby lead to prolonged inflammation, prolonged reepithelialization, potentially clinically, the dysuria and potential urgency related to small nerve damage beneath the surface of the capsule. Occasionally, as we work in a retrograde manner to remove pieces of tissue, we will find ourselves with a small stalk of tissue in which the base is close to the bladder neck. In order to make sure we simply cut this, I tend to put the laser fiber in contact with the mucosa and take short zips, pushing horizontally and almost pulling back the fiber so that we at least engage the tissue and bring it within the prosthetic fossa. This is important to do to avoid any intravesical or ureteral orifice damage. We continue to work on the floor, which is obviously the bulk of this gentleman's obstruction, coming from a 5 o'clock direction now, to meet with the floor at the 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock areas. Once we have debulked the majority of this tissue, Simple pure vaporization can be done centripetally toward the capsule over this area. We can also readdress this issue nearing the end of the procedure once the lateral lobes have been properly addressed. While now treating more the left lobe, we get encountered with small submucosal bleeders, which will just take the time to combination of both coagulation as well as vaporization treat in order to maintain great tissue visualization.
in order to formally, by the book, treat the left lateral lobe, we tend to make our incision at 1 o'clock, and thereby down a capsule, allowing this left lateral lobe to drop into the floor, which has been opened up by the treatment of the 5 and 7 o'clock roofs. Sequential short zips, particularly in this very short prostate, are required in order to not pull back too far and injure the sphincter. At the same time, not get too through the tissue and get into the surgical capsule where there is no posterior zone and no other areas behind the capsule aside from the dorsal venous complex, which could amount to significant bleeding. So in smaller prostates, we tend to lower the power down to 120 to address this. Repetitious passes over the same one o'clock area are required at the same angle and same direction until we start seeing the surgical capsule, after which we'll start pointing our laser more toward two and three and then toward four o'clock to start becoming the tangent of the capsule to remove the tissue off the capsule. In essence, a nucleation-like inner technique. Once that lateral lobe begins to fall, we will identify quite nicely the sulcus. And at that point, again, we can return to 180 watts and perform vaporization either from above, from below, or from neutral position at 6 o'clock, aiming into the adenoma. And therefore, we can treat this like the upside or down letter U, either from one side, the contralateral side, or the base, which is that in the center of the prostate. Again, on the floor at the five o'clock position, there's still that stubborn area of tissue, which requires more treatment to fully remove it, again prompting and allowing for a nicer epithelialization, a more definitive tre tissue treatment, and we want to, really want to make sure the minim to minimize the amount of inflammation to prevent fibrosis, stricture formation, potentially retreatment of these patients down the road. One must have good patience, perseverance, and persistence over these stubborn areas to really make sure that each patient gets a complete ablation and tissue removal of the transition zone. This will allow for the best outcomes, the least complications, and more importantly, the durability of such procedures. It is the endpoint definition and the treatment down to that area that is most important, rather than just the laser, the surgeon and the surgical technique really will define 
how our patients will do. Here we have treated the majority of the floor and left lateral lobe. However, there's still a little bit of bleeding anteriorly, and we will take the time now to address this and continue on with the treatment of the right lateral lobe. Here we can see rather than creating an 11 o'clock groove, we'll come back, reverse our positioning of our camera to allow the fiber to come to a 1 o'clock position, but aim toward the 11 o'clock direction so we can surf the capsule heading in the opposite direction. This will allow, again, the continuation of a nice smooth capsule and the minimization of potentially going through the capsule since we now know where it is. Again, just following a pre established surgical plane, it's simple, it makes sense, and it leads to better outcomes and least complications. Here we can see we're identifying and following that surgical capsule, sometimes encountering small little perforators, slowing things down, compressing, using the coagulation, and then following through with the same surgical plane. We can now appreciate the small stock of tissue that has been identified and created, thereby chiseling it off and pushing it into the bladder for later retrieval is what our plan will be. We will continue inferiorly from our pre-established 7 o'clock groove and then anteriorly from the 1 and 11 o'clock areas of incision to come down to meet in the middle at the same time not just removing the entire adenoma but also combining it with vaporization only with the 180 watt power setting. Care is also made near the apex, and this to me is the biggest challenge to BPA surgeries. There's a fine line between it and the sphincter, and overtreatment and potentially beyond the apex will lead to incontinence. Of also importance is it is the area that is most commonly undertreated by surgeons. And the reason why is that concern for incontinence, and as we know, for those that we've retreated, the most common areas that are Undertreated 
or have regrowth are the apices. So it's important to make sure to park this camera near the vera montanum and really vaporize and treat the tissue lateral to the vera montanum. What is called sometimes as a lonely vera montanum and deobstructing the prosthetic channel with proper and adequate apical dissection. It is for that reason why I think it is so important, especially novice surgeons and even for all levels of surgeons, to pre-mark at the very beginning of the surgery in the most optimal conditions that limit of dissection in front of the vera montanum. So such this plays an important role to making sure that our patients remain continent after the surgery. As you see here, we are now debulking some remaining tissue on the left lateral lobe, taking the time to incise and remove these pieces in small segments for later retrieval. As you can see here, although a very small prostate measured at 40 grams, most people doing any laser surgeries can appreciate that this is a very dense prostate. Occasionally, we vaporize and it's like cotton candy. It just melts away. In this instance, particularly on the floor and that left lateral lobe, very dense stromal tissue and just requires, again, more patience, undermining and vaporization as well as this idea of tissue removal are what is needed to get a nice clean floor for proper healing. This differs than the 7 o'clock groove in the right lobe, as we can see here quite nicely, the capsule. Even here you can see that it is even thin at some areas, so care must be made not to go through and vaporize more in these areas, which will obviously lead into capsular perforation. Nevertheless, I still take the time, especially at this right apex, to choke up very close near the vera montanum to vaporize down that remaining tissue. Some finishing touches up are now performed on the contralateral side and we're going to inspect for decent hemostasis with the water turned off and follow this up with specimen retrieval using our graspers. <laughs> 
here using the same instruments for the scope. We pass through our working bridge of seven French, a ureteroscopic grasper, and this will repetitiously remove all remaining tissues of significant size in the bladder for pathological evaluation. Here, when inspecting once again, we can clearly see the right ureteral orifice, which remains intact and undamaged. We continue passing our sheath along with the graspers into the bladder to remove all remaining tissue. Note the clarity of the efflux, and this is simply with a very low flow setting that we can also appreciate the small diverticulums of the bladder, which is an att attestation to this patient's long-term obstruction for quite a small prostate. Particularly for these larger pieces, we tend to remove the entire sheath along with the grasper and the tissue. This allows, number one, for us to pull up bigger pieces. It also keeps the bladder full and creating that hydrostatic pressure versus simply disconnecting the outflow and allowing the bladder to empty so that when we go back a second time, we don't have much water in the bladder. The blood percentage per fluid is much greater and therefore minimizes uh, visualizations. So for that reason, we take the entire sheath out for every removal of tissue pieces. Once all the tissue has been removed and we're happy with our surgical defect, we will disconnect the camera and for purpose of being a non-edited video, we will now transition from the scope to detaching the camera head to continue to demonstrate the color of the fluid and how we place in our Foley catheter with a stylet 
and insert 30 cc's into the balloon and provide gentle traction and the traction is aided by the placement of a 4x8 which is gently moistened with saline and tied into a knot and slipped up to the level of the gland's penis. So as such, during this phase we have overfilled the bladder with continuous irrigation in and closed off the outflow valve. We will then slip out the 23 French resectoscope sheath gently and immediately place in a 20 French Foley catheter over a stylet with 30 cc's in the balloon. The very small detail of overfilling the bladder serves many purposes including hydrostatic pressure for hemostasis and upon placement of the catheter we are 100% sure we're in the bladder simply by the clear jet of the pressure of that water in the bladder. So as such, for surgeons, it eliminates the question whether or not we're retrotrigonal. It's a nice, simple way to get better hemostasis and not waste time by needing to re-irrigate the bladder. We now demonstrate the placement of the traction knot. A wet sponge is wrapped around the catheter, tied into a strong knot, and then brought up to the glands penis simply to provide capillary-like compression. We know that the type of oozing that occurs after the surgery is more capillary and more venule versus large venous or arterial just due to the, he due to the hemostatic properties of the green light laser. So as such, some gentle traction with a 30cc balloon against the blotter neck is all that's needed in the recovery room to clear things up. We will just irrigate two or three more times the bladder to a full, to an empty, to a full, just to eliminate all remaining small debris and to ensure good hemostasis. This completes the educational video for a small 40 gram prostate standardized laser vaporization technique by Dr. Kevin Zorn. Thank you for your attention.